I kind of was trying to think of a topic to cover for you guys, um, and I didn't really have a burning laryngology topic that we didn't have it, like already scheduled or haven't talked about here recently. Uh, so I was thinking about professional development and CV stuff. Um, and I don't think you guys really ever get this um, talked about. Um, correct me if I'm wrong or if you've had any, um, I know uh, Dr. Jones gives you some like business um, talks throughout the year, throughout your training, just to kind of go over some random things. But this is gonna be kind of a touch upon a lot of that stuff just to think about when you, are trying to look for a job or a fellowship or after job um, when you're trying to just get out there and be um, uh, get involved with with uh, locally, uh, regionally, nationally, all that stuff, um, whatever way you want to do it. I'll try to kind of touch upon a lot of the stuff that's obviously this is a little bit different from academics versus private versus fellowship versus uh, going in general practice, um, but a lot of it is kind of the same. So, so CV. Um, I think the biggest thing for CVs is to make it simple, make it readable, make it something to where people can um, um, look at it. Well, and I'll bring up my own um, that you guys can ridicule here and take a look at just so you can have like a, kind of an example to go over. Um, I tried to shorten it, obviously, to where it just has kind of pertinent uh, topics on it. Um, but you need to make it uh, nice and readable, not too busy uh, with stuff because you want to make it um, something people look at, glance quickly, know your your name in big glossy letters. Um, um, first things first, I can't remember what I was thinking about. For that. Um, basically, I always put it like the, the first things that you want the reader to look at. It's going to be different from if you're looking at like a general job versus like an academic job. If you're looking for an academic job, you don't have like your education, then your employment, then your um, uh, your publications like fairly upfront. Uh, other uh, jobs you might want to have things kind of reversed in, in order. Uh, if you're looking more for an education point of view, then you might want to have your education credentials up there first. So put your first things you want to brag about yourself um, first. Uh, this is not a time to be humble. This is the time to brag about yourself, to put all your stuff down on paper, um, to really kind of put out there what you have done. Uh, you guys have done a lot. Um, before you got here, while you're here, um, and, and on after this. Like you wanna brag about yourself to the fullest extent. I know it's not something that a lot of us are really used to doing. Um, um, do not put anything on there that, I mean, I think probably a lot of you um, had this talk or, or had some talk about this when you're applying for residencies, but you don't really wanna put anything on the CV that you don't own. Like if someone would ask you about a paper on there, um, that they're really interested in, then you don't, you're, it's like crickets. You don't have anything to say about it. That's bad. <laughs> like you don't want to be like that third author on that paper and then really come out like, oh, you don't, didn't really do much on that to really own it. So um, make sure that like, especially when you're going to go for a job interview or something like, you know, all the publications that you've done, you've kind of just glanced at them or something. That's what I did on my job interview trail myself before I was looking for uh, jobs after fellowship, just to really own it. So example, we'll go to my example. And if you guys have any questions, please, please stop me. This is um, supposed to be very informal. If you guys have any pointers from what you've um, done, uh, especially chiefs and seniors, please let me know. Um, so I put my name right up there at the top. I just have one email address. Um, you can have, I would I mean, I know several of you probably have a couple different email addresses, like a personal and a work. Um, for a lot of you guys, if you're uh, looking um, at jobs, starting to get ready, I might not make it your UK email from here. I might make it your personal email just so that um, you will not have your UK email for forever. Like I know from NYU, when I was leaving there, I lost it within two days after graduating. So um, just be careful at where you put your, your email stuff. Um, just my cell phone, and then I don't really have my address on here. Um, I just go straight into education. I like these um, tabs um, or uh, uh, little line sections where you can kind of easily kind of scan down. It's nice, big, bold, and solid. I have sections for education. I have my most recent thing first. Um, I have like smaller font, just kind of make it a little bit um, 
less eye catching and less busy. Uh, try to have spaces whenever possible uh, so things aren't just crammed together. Uh, I go to like the professional academic positions. This is more where you'd have like your jobs um, or any type of uh, spot that you've been in the past. So you guys might not have much in here as of yet. I mean, I don't really have anything in here from prior to, uh, to fellowship on here. Uh, honors, uh, this is anything that you've kind of been given before. Um, it can go back as far as you feel comfortable. Like I, I still have stuff from college um, in some of my honors and some of my stuff section. I don't really go back to high school. I mean, no one really cares about high school, I think, anymore. But um, that is something just to be uh, considered about how far back you want to go. Um, publications, uh, this is uh, shortened since I didn't want to give everything into there, but um, the ones from back a long time ago, they have like the full, um, full um, citation, the full reference here. But then as you uh, look further on, uh, you can see I've tried to bold where my name is just so people can quickly look, see like where, where are you in this? Are you first author, are you last author, that type of stuff. Um, and then you can see here, this is published ahead of print. So this is like an online only where they can find it. So it's not gonna have a uh, perfect way to find it. Uh, sometimes there's gonna be like a DOI that people can look at for. Uh, and then here's another one that's just an example of a submitted paper. Uh, once it's submitted, I, um, I'd encourage all of you guys to put it on your CV just so you don't forget about it. Uh, and also just get in the habit of updating. Like if you ever get accepted for a poster presentation, if you ever get accepted for an oral presentation, if you get a paper submitted, if you do a book chapter, Put it on your CV before you forget about it. Um, that's one thing that uh, I think has been very helpful for me just to not forget stuff. So um, I'd encourage you all for that. Um, I have another section for book chapters, uh, another section for oral presentations, also very shortened down. For this, I would put any of your grand rounds. Uh, and it, I mean, those are full. Um, sorry, what's that? Someone, um, if you go to any um, big meeting, I'd obviously have that there. Uh, if any uh, big talk within the department, I would put that there. Um, so I would, uh, like the research symposium, I would for sure put that as an oral presentation here. Uh, this is definitely, uh, again, a time to brag about yourself. Uh, poster presentations, um, I, I, as soon as something is accepted, I go ahead and put it in there. Uh, so as you see here, COSM is not gonna happen. <laughs> but I still put this on my CV um, just to uh, not forget about it, like, um, and just go ahead and put it onto there. Uh, you have the date on there, so it's obviously uh, not happened yet. Uh, and like we said, this is really necessarily gonna even happen. So, um, but then as you go further back, just having the date where this is located and just a quick little blurb about it. Um, memberships, um, certifications, this is another section that I have um, just if you're, um, I mean, Kentucky Society of Otolingology, all of you can technically be members, it's free. Uh, you can list that. If you're, uh, all of you, I believe, are also members in the, in the academy, so I would definitely put that as well. Um, and then once you're board eligible or board certified, I would also put that for when you're finishing with the, your training. Um, we'll get to all of these other things uh, here in a bit. Uh, professional activities. Here's kind of where you can put all of, like the riffraff. Uh, this is stuff I didn't really have um, um, necessarily before um, um, starting a job because I didn't know really where to put this. But if you're a reviewer, if you've done any reviewing for any uh, journal before, go ahead and put it there. Uh, if you have um, done anything with any committees at the academy, if you've done anything uh, doing a mission trip, uh, I would put that here. Like this, again, this is kind of a nice section to kind of a catch-all um, for uh, bragging about yourself and just putting yourself out there. Um, this is a section I just started this past year, uh, which I kind of like. Um, this is what um, uh, put for like our two-year review that uh, Dr. Keckner, Gupta, and I did like within with internally within the department. And I kind of like this as a, just kind of a way to look back at like, this is how you're getting yourself out there. This is, these are the big meetings you've gone to. Um, and it's also a way you can kind of remember what you've actually done. I, I didn't have this before this year, but I kind of like it. Um, this is more academic curriculum and mentorship. That's more for academic. Uh, if you're in a um, in teaching experience, uh, if you're an academic, uh, spot. If you've ever done a podcast, if you've ever done like any type of uh, uh, 
men's weekly article, which I know Dr. Comer's done before if he's on this, um, put that here. Uh, it's not a um, peer reviewed journal by any means, um, but it's something that still uh, put yourself out there and it's uh, another media. Um, and then interests. I, I mean, just looking at the um, people applying for residency um, this year, I mean, looking at all their interests, I mean, this sparks conversation. Again, don't put anything here that you're not going to be able to kind of own and talk about for a good five minute stretch for small talk. Um, but if there's anything on there, um, um, like it should hopefully make a, a, a great connection with someone you're talking with. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. Any questions about CV? Crickets. You guys can still hear me, right? Yes, I, I have a question actually. Sure. For for those of us who are submitting to COSM, but obviously that won't be happening, what should we list You know, after that's, it's already happened? That's a very good question. Um, I was probably going to um, make a note here. Um, I mean, COSM, some meetings like ABEA, ALA, um, I don't, I haven't heard anything from TRIO. Um, those are the three meetings that I was going to go to within COSM. Um, mm -hmm. They might have a virtual meeting. So I mean, okay. our posters are going to be submitted. I don't right. know about oral presentations, about how, how do they do that, but they're already even looking about how they do that. Um, I was probably just going to be like virtual um, with the coronavirus or um, something like that, just to make it known that, um, like, you know, that meeting didn't happen. Sure. But okay. And still um, accepted, and you still wrote that publication and wrote that poster. So, okay. Uh, that's a very good question. Okay. Put in the date here, like, you can even put it in here now. Um, that's what I do. I mean, it's, it has a date in the future. Um, it's mm -hmm. our assumed that you're going to have it there. So, uh, different yeah. from publication where, like, you really just have to have it, sub like, actually click submit button before you actually talk to here. Uh, yeah. Um, oral, kind of the same thing as posters, I think. As long as it's been accepted, uh, someone's obviously interested in your work, so you might as well put it up there. So, good question. Other questions, CV, before we go? On I also, just a more formatting type of thing, do yeah. you find that numbers, using numbers instead of bullet points is more useful in terms of seeing how many, th like overall glancing, they can see like how many things you've done in categories I, or? I like numbers for certain things. Um, so um, for obviously like education, uh, professional, academic stuff, like I'm not going to be numbering that. Um, but for looking for posters, for oral presentations, publications, I think it's very quick and easy and dirty just for someone that's looking over a thing just to, oh, they, they have five publications. Again, this is short and I have many more than this. But <laughs> again, uh, you can like quickly know how many they have done. Uh, you can see like how many book chapters they've done. You can see how many oral presentations they've done, any posters. Uh, those are really the only ones I number. Um, all the rest of them, you can kind of see I do them based off of year, uh, if it's a type of thing like that, or just um, um, bolded and not really even any, any bullet points. So yeah, I, I, I typically, as a reader of this, as well as making CVs, I like to see the numbers in certain sections. Does that answer your question, Kate? Yeah, yeah, I know that makes sense. Okay, uh, let's go on to uh, other stuff. So professional development. This is a whole huge catch-all. Um, really, this this whole pandemic thing just kind of makes me uh, reminisce about my second year in um, residency when Hurricane Sandy knocked down three out of the four of the hospitals that I covered, and I had to figure out like what the heck am I going to do um, through all this to kind of make myself shine for uh, fellowship, for job, what? So uh, you have a little bit of downtime. Um, this is kind of what prompted me to kind of think about this too, like um, shine up your CV, uh, figure out a plan. Uh, if you look at your CV, it almost kind of forces you to see the holes in it, see what things you still need to, um, to make, um, to do, uh, things you might still have on your to-do list um, that you can make and uh, make yourself be proud of yourself so you can give that to whatever next step that you're looking at and, and uh, get that next job, get that next fellowship, get whatever, what you, whatever you want to do. Um, 
research. I kind of came to the conclusion during Hurricane Sandy uh, in New York City and uh, kind of after that, that in residency, you don't have much time to pad your CV. Um, I mean, I just talked about a lot of the CV stuff, but um, you give oral presentations to the department or, or to uh, uh, places. Uh, you give, um, you work your butt off. Uh, working your butt off doesn't necessarily go into your CV for residency. A lot of these things you had when you were in medical school, when you were applying to residency, uh, regarding like, all oh, these are all the different ways you volunteered and everything. Uh, I don't know about you, but I didn't do much volunteering when I was in residency because I was always really tired after <laughs> working. So um, what ways do you have to actually pad your CV? What ways do you have to distinguish yourself from other ones? Uh, from other people, um, especially when you're looking at fellowship research. I mean, really, that's one of the only ways um, outside of letters and people going to bat for you, which I think everyone in the department can go to bat for you, whatever fellowship you're looking at. Uh, research is one of the big ways that you can distinguish yourself. Um, uh, we'll talk about uh, fellowship search uh, right now. for those that are curious about that. Uh, look at job search because uh, that's uh, a little different and even if you go through fellowship you'll still have to do a job search. Uh, societies and academy will kind of circle around back to that uh, for like how you guys get involved, when it is useful, when um, you might think it's not useful, which I go over the pluses and minuses for that. Uh, and then when you're on the job, I mean this is not just uh, getting to there, but this is like the things to think about when you're such upon like physician liaisons, coders, office manager, and then like how do you become tenured at your own department? Um, research. Um, again, what other way is there to distinguish yourself during residency? Uh, research gets you those poster presentations, poster presentations, gets you those publications. A uh, lot of ways that you can um, uh, get yourself out there. Um, this is one of those ways. Uh, posters, oral presentations, papers. Um, utilize medical students and other healthcare providers. What I mean by that is like uh, speech language pathologists, uh, not only for finding the projects uh, or engineers, or I mean, we're on a undergraduate campus, with tons of researchers. Um, there are typically tons of researchers. Um, there's a lot of people that you can utilize to augment your time, augment your experience. You guys bring a lot of clinical know-how of uh, research, uh, even at your stage of residency, um, that um, medical students don't have that. They can do chart checking, they can do uh, chart draws, um, but they don't have like the clinical um, gestalt for like, what does it all mean? So um, I think you can augment your research time, your all of your other stuff uh, by utilizing medical students specifically, as well as speech language pathologists, students, um, engineering students, all the other types of um, people across, uh, statisticians, all over people across the whole uh, enterprise uh, for doing this. Um, and I really, um, I don't, collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Like there's just no reason to do it within the bubble. If you're having questions, ask. If you uh, look upon someone who's doing something really cool, ask them about it. Um, maybe it'll stimulate another question where that person wants to do something about this. Um, I think, um, I know some of you guys like in your second year it's like hard to uh, do too much and especially like during your intern years it's hard to do too much but just keep your ears open talk with attendings if they are doing something that you kind of like or or have some downtime in between stuff ask them what their research projects are just so you can uh, kind of go over uh, and kind of figure out what else can you get yourself involved with um, fellowships I think most of you know all this but um, and I think I'm, I'm still probably missing one of the fellowships out there, so I apologize if I forgot one. Uh, laryngology is obviously the best fellowship ever. So um, there's also head and neck, which some of them have recon, um, some of them don't. Um, there's rhinology and skull base. Uh, that, uh, some of them have more of a focus on one of the others. Uh, there's facial plastics, which facial plastics has a whole huge um, um, very variety within it. Um, a couple of them have um, some more recon for head and neck um, and, and doing free flaps. Uh, more of them are just private based, more of them are, are some, some are just uh, academic spots. Um, some others do Mohs recon more. Um, there's a lot of different variety, especially within facial plastics. 
Um, there are otology fellowships uh, as well as neurotology fellowships, slightly different. Otology is typically one year. Uh, neurotology, uh, I think there's only, when I was looking through, there are only 13 spots a year, so not too much. Um, neurotology is more of the skull base in addition to the otology. And then you obviously have pediatrics. Um, then you have uh, much less often you have sleep and then um, some people even do allergy fellowships. Are there any ones that I missed within that? We'll go with no. Um, so what is, I'll just go over laryngology just since I can speak about that a little bit more um, specifically. A lot of this kind of crossovers too. Um, this focuses more on like the voice, airway, swallow, and laryngeal cancer management, which is you've seen it day in, day out. Um, you, most fellowships with laryngology will focus on endoscopic means, um, but a few will have more of an open bent to them, like doing open cases. Uh, you're with anywhere between one fellowship director to five different laryngologists in this. And this is probably similar to a lot of other fellowships. It can be either with one person that is very productive, especially the smaller fellowships uh, like neurotology, uh, rhinology, um, um, facial plastics, um, that it'll typically be like one or two person show. But then other people like uh, head and neck or pediatrics, you might be with a whole huge group of people. And that creates a lot of different dynamics in terms of um, how much you're doing with that person, how much uh, um, uh, independence you get. Some of them are ACGME accredited, meaning that you're not really taking uh, attending call, um, but a lot of them are not accredited. So you will be counted like an attending, but being paid like a resident. So it's a little bit strange in terms of that. Um, uh, they're typically one year. Um, I don't really know of any laryngology fellowships that are longer than one year. Uh, some peds are two years, like at CHOP and at Cincinnati. Uh, some head and neck are, are more than one year, but a lot of them will come with research funding or research time dedicated for that second or third year. Um, and typically a lot of these fellowships, uh, laryngology is on the NRMP match. I'm not sure what the other ones are located on. Um, the, uh, this was from a couple of years ago, uh, the one I could find. Um, you typically apply at a certain time. It's very kind of less, much less daunting than residency applications. I always thought like, am I missing something here? It just seemed too simple. Um, just, you need your CV, you need two to three letters of recommendation, and then like just a personal statement. And that was essentially it. Then you just literally email that to the director, the fellowship director at that site, uh, at least for laryngology, and it's probably similar to the other, other spots. You don't put it to a central server. Um, at least I didn't do it when I was going through. The um, So it almost kind of, you need to make sure that they actually got your email. <laughs> there are a couple places that um, didn't really respond in time. So like, oh, did, you, did you get it? Like, I, did I submit it appropriately? Am I gonna get an invitation to your program? Um, there are two programs uh, when I was looking through that were outside the match. Um, this, this was uh, Blitzer in New York City and Zytel, not Zytel, Zytel's in uh, Massachusetts General Hospital. Um, but most of them are out inside the match. Uh, this is pretty much up to date, but these were all the centers uh, for laryngology. Not all the fellowships will be worth their salt, so to speak, in terms of like after you train. Um, I like to think after you train here at Kentucky, some of them, you can go to some of these places and teach them some stuff. Um, um, other places uh, will have more volume, we'll, we'll see more stuff where you can kind of get more uh, uh, hands-on experience. Other ones will be hands-off experience. Uh, this goes for all the fellowships. Uh, it's the same thing for uh, residency, the same thing you're looking for in fellowships in terms of how much hands-on experience are you getting, how much are you teaching residents, how much are you taking call. Uh, all this comes into play. Uh, for what you're actually going to be doing. Do you have an off-site clinic? Uh, a lot of these times you'll have like a general clinic at an off-site location just to kind of help pay for your salary for that year. Um, so all these things to kind of consider when you're looking at places. Any questions on fellowship and fellowship searches while we're on that? Typically it's in your fourth year. I think uh, neurotology is the only one that's in your fifth year. Job search. Um, so this doesn't necessarily apply for fellowship searches, but at some point you guys will be looking for a job. 
Um, lots of ways to look for those jobs. Um, you can do cold calling. Uh, if you have a certain location that you're wanting to try to go to or a certain institution or a certain practice, call them, uh, email them, um, do something to try to uh, get your name known. Uh, even just a handwritten letter, not handwritten, but a uh, typewritten letter um, and mail it to them. Uh, other ways that you can just kind of make your name known and make yourself uh, kind of available. Um, listservs and headhunting groups, um, if they haven't already, they will find you. <laughs> um, they are still sending me stuff to this day and I can't get off their lists. Um, Academy has a job hunt day. Um, they have a better name for it, but um, basically a day where you scan your badge and they um, they have a lot of job offerings there at that day, but then from that, they actually put you on to some of these listservs uh, for then getting information about future jobs in the future. Uh, and I, I swear, like, once you get onto one of these listservs, you're onto all of them, because I think they share them and sell them between each other. Um, journals will sometimes have um, spots on the, in the back where they list job openings. Uh, you can look at the back of your Lemmingoscope or White Journal if you guys still, um, or even online, uh, to actually see them. Uh, Doximity, I think, is becoming more and more a way that, that jobs can be posted and found. Uh, word of mouth. Uh, this is how I found my job here. Um, so basically, word of mouth. Uh, uh, Dr. Iverson was emailing uh, back to my fellow director down at Medical College, Georgia, saying, hey, do you have a, fel do you have a, um, a laryngologist that could be coming up here in Kentucky? Uh, it wasn't really posted anywhere. So I got mine completely up here from word of mouth. Um, fellowship directors and uh, residency mentors um, hopefully will be sending you all this stuff because a lot of this stuff does come from word of mouth or their uh, emails are solicited and sent out to the directors uh, or to the people that, um, that know. Uh, I know that the Fall Voice um, program um, for laryngology has um, in the past couple of years compiled a whole list of open jobs for laryngology specifically uh, that's very helpful to kind of have in one centralized location and that comes out in October uh, every year. Uh, one big big thing for job search that you need to be aware of um, not to really scare you but there's no time frame for job searches. It's first come first serve. It's not like a, a deadline where you have to get in your, your application in for your, um, your NRMP match or for your ERAS or something and then you have a rank uh, list due and then you have a match day where everything happens. Uh, it's first come first serve. I made my first calls um, for jobs in July in my fellowship year. So right when I first started and um, I think some of you even like have like some types of jobs lined up for after fellowship. Um, <clears throat> Adam. So, um, but um, the, I think that is great. Like in terms of, uh, you don't wanna be in your fellowship and then be in April of your fellowship year and then not have a job lined up. It does take some time, even after you get a job to get your license, to get accredited at your next institution. So a lot of this stuff, a lot of this time does take time. It takes time to find a place uh, to live in for the next, uh, for the, uh, the next job. Um, one um, co-resident that I had uh, in training, she actually didn't find the job of her dreams, uh, for, but she found a job that was going to come up in a year for after she finished her head and neck fellowship. She actually did locum tenants, and I think she had glowing like um, recommendation for locum tenants. Like it's great in terms of uh, it's a, a discrete time. Uh, you can set your time for some of them uh, to where you're only going to be working certain amounts of days. It's pretty well paying, uh, and then it's only going and it's going to pay your salary, and then it's going to be a great way that you can then go um, set up for your next job. It's going to allow enough time for interviews and for other stuff. Um, so that's it for that. Uh, any questions on job search? Contracts. Um, this is hopefully your job search will land in a contract. Um, um, typically, you'll go for like a interview, and then following that, or maybe even a second look interview, uh, you'll get a contract or get um, them at least to say they're interested. And they do. Uh, we want to move forward towards a contract, and then you will say yay or nay. Um, when you get a contract, 
uh, get someone to look at this, uh, qualified lawyer, qualified group. Um, I'm now blanking on the name of the group that I used, but there's a, um, a group that just looks at physician contracts. Uh, and I would definitely utilize someone who has experience in this matter because you, you better know that the practice or the institution or the hospital you're going to um, has lawyers that are, that are ponying up to them and protecting them. You need to know what's in that language, know what's going to um, possibly hurt you in the future, know what, where, how you're going to get paid, know, know all the different language about that. And one of the great things about utilizing some of these services is that they actually give you um, how much people are uh, paid in your region, in your specialty, um, what kind of the layout is. So it gives you some bargaining power to be able to do that. Some of them even bargain for you. It's more money for when you do that. And I, I didn't do that. Um, I don't think many people do when they first go out for their first job. Um, but uh, it's something to definitely consider for if you uh, have to move or go someplace else, like to get someone to actually uh, bargain for you. Uh, do not sign the contract without um, a lawyer or someone taking a look at it. There are a lot of languages within it that uh, you're not, I mean, you can't read unless you have the lawyer jargon uh, speak, uh, which none of us have. Um, you don't want to get in a situation where you don't have anything behind you. Uh, and maybe you have a paper that's basically owning you for that year or however long you're in that contract for. Um, how you are paid. Uh, this is big. There's a lot of different models out there. This should be kind of within the contract or at least kind of spelled out before you sign. Um, is it an review based model? Is it a collections based model? Is it a like a base model, like just a, a complete just salary that you get that doesn't really change? Um, are you guaranteed a certain amount of money when you first start? How does that ramp up once you meet your targets? Uh, a lot of places will have kind of a two year um, span where they assume that you're not going to make your full target and pay for your salary. So they kind of have that built in. But then after that, what happens? Um, be cautious about these places in, in like Timbuktu, Oklahoma, or um, North Dakota, or someplace that are offering a load of money for you to go and they guarantee it for the first couple of years. A lot of times that's inversely proportional for how much you will then get once you're there in practice. But then they have you, they have you kind of had Maybe you've gotten a home there, maybe you've developed roots, and then you uh, are kind of stuck there afterwards. So be cautious. Know what other people are making. Uh, it's not something you necessarily want to ask the first time you're there on an interview, um, but that's something that um, plenty of people that I've known have gotten information about um, how much people are made, uh, how much people make. For those going to public institutions, all state institutions have it where they have salaries posted um, online where you can find it. So um, a lot of the um, academic institutions I was looking at were public institutions. They had all this data available, at least in terms of the base model that people were getting paid, where I could figure out how, like, okay, so if I'm in this for like 10 years, what, what's going to be my long-term um, salary from this job, so to speak, if, if I stay there, or, or will it stay the same for forever and eternity? Um, how is consulting dealt with? Um, like in terms of how does other money come into you afterwards? Is it your money? Is it the group's money? Is it the institution's money? Um, intellectual property, um, how is that dealt with? Is it, um, is it going to be yours? Uh, that's something that if you're bringing in something or, or have some other uh, um, consulting or some type of relationships beforehand, you might want to get that word, word into the contract. Uh, Non-compete. This is Another thing that typically is worded somewhere in a lot of these, um, it's kind of always questionable to me how much non-competes non are essentially, so you, you stop working at your institution where you have this contract from. You cannot set up shop across the street day one right after you finish that job and compete with that hospital or institution or practice that you were just working for. It's a way that they can, um, hospital workers and institution or practices can kind of protect themselves from bringing in uh, potential competition. Um, this will be I'll typically have a year um, or two or so uh, uh, years associated with it, as well as a mileage distance from the, the signpost or the institution that they're located at. Uh, it can be fairly aggressive in terms of stuff and um, 
it's also questionable in terms of how people can really enforce these uh, non-competes as well. I've never really seen good data on how they're enforced. Um, this is big for when you're looking at these jobs. If they don't have, like if you wanna do ears and they don't have ear equipment, get those supplies at least in writing or as part of the contract before you sign. Once you sign, they have you like they, they don't really they're not really driven towards doing anything more for making you feel at home making you know that you can uh, get all your stuff done you need to get that stuff in writing so you know you can actually do what you want to do and operate how you want to deal with your patients when you start um, and not per scrambling for it and begging the or begging the service and begging everything else afterwards for that equipment um, I think any of the people here, uh, Erica or, or in the OR, would gladly give you the supply lists uh, from here if you're looking uh, for specific things. Uh, I'll gladly give you all my stuff that I asked for before I came here if you're looking for laryngology specific things. Uh, it's very specific and institutions will not always have it before you go there. Uh, any questions on contracts, job search and stuff? I'm gonna switch gears here a little. Societies and Academy. So they, they, there are a ton of societies out there for ENT. There's trio, trilateral societies like the ears, the nose, the throat. Like I think that's the trio thing. I can't remember exactly why it came out not to be like that. ABEA, this is American Bronchoesophageal Article Association. Uh, I was set to be inducted into this in, at COSM, which who knows when that will actually happen. Um, that's also a lot of PEDS crossover too. So some a lot of ASPO members will be in this too. ALA is American Laryngological Association. So those are the two like um, laryngology associations. There's American Rhinological Society, ARS. There's AAFPRS, um, which is facial plastics or recon. Uh, H&S was American Head Neck Society. There's American Otological Society, uh, Otology, Otological Society. And then there's American Neuro Neurotological Society. And there's ASPO, uh, which is the pediatric. Um, within this, um, trio, you typically have to have a thesis to actually uh, become a full member. The, uh, which that, the requirements for that have gone way down over the past few years. Um, but it's a whole stepwise process where you have to be through that. And become a member in ALA and AOS. Um, ALA and AOS, you actually have to be a trio member and then get invited to become a so you have, you have to do all of these certain things and be in practice for so long and, and, and know people and be well known. And then you still have to get invited. Um, so it's very difficult to uh, become a member into this because they actually almost cap the number of people that can be in that as well. Um, for full member, most of these societies will have the ability for, uh, for you to be a resident member or a fellow member for virtually or most of the time free, if not just a very little amount of money. So like I said, lots of these have the ability to join for free and get some of the benefits um, and attend their meetings for little to no money. Um, uh, everyone has different requirements. They're all different. ABEA, you only have to be in, out in practice for three years and have like three different publications with your name on it in order and have like a couple different letters of recommendation before you become, a, a, become eligible to become a full member. Um, facts, I didn't really cover this as a Fellow of American College of Surgeons. Uh, this is kind of an overarching one for surgeons. If you want to put that after your name, uh, you can do that. Um, several of the people in our department have done that. I really haven't seen a lot of good data on it to figure out what it gives you. Um, a lot of these societies will have um, the ability to uh, network, to um, reach out to people that are doing similar things to you. Um, the fellow from American College of Surgery, they're so large, I don't know how much they're going to help a laryngologist like myself. Um, but it is, they are our dues. Once you become a full member, it's going to be money out of your pocket uh, or money of your professional funds to cover um, uh, that those dues or else you let it, let it slide. Um, Academy has committees uh, to sign up for if you have interest, even as a resident or a fellow, uh, whatever um, kind of level you're at. Um, you can attend these at Academy, uh, even if you're not a committee member. Um, you can, um, and if you attend
and then that puts you a little bit higher in terms of if you apply to it next year. The, um, it's very, fairly easy to kind of get to become a committee member if you want to. This is kind of where a lot of the grassroots stuff comes within the academy in terms of um, clinical practice guidelines, in terms of uh, different fights with insurance companies over payments. Um, this is, um, I think, very beneficial for you when you're first getting out there and first uh, getting trying to get your name known as well as to know the people that you uh, that are helpful for you for later on. Uh, Academy also has grants to sign up for mission trips, uh, which I think you guys already know about from Bush, uh, but also for travel grants to the actual meeting. Uh, this typically comes out sometime in the summer to where when you guys know you're actually having something that's being submitted there or you know you're going to go there anyway you should have tried to apply to these travel grants i don't know uh, i got it one year it, it's not always very well publicized in terms of what i've seen in the past um, but i think you should definitely try to do that and that's another thing you can just go on your cv if you get one of these like grants that should go on your cv in terms of an honor or something you got uh, switch gears to when you're actually on the job uh, which i think is learned since I started here in Kentucky um, uh, two and a half years ago. Physician liaisons. Um, I don't know, if, do you guys even know what physician liaisons are? Anyone, anyone know any physician liaisons here? I'll take that as a no. These are the people that actually put on the Doctor Appreciation Day every year. So I, I know you guys have probably been to some of the, been in the booth for they um, are your friend and cheerleader. They are the ones that I've gone out to physically to visit practices like other ENTs, pulmonologists, um, allergists, um, GI specialists, internal medicine doctors, uh, practices. Um, they, um, they also are the physical people that go out to meet your referral base, uh, whatever that may be. I mean, if you're going to pediatrics, they, they will be into pediatric practices day in, day out to kind of um, they say, hey, what do you need any help getting uh, your patient in to see uh, Dr. Van Horn? Or I can make that happen for you. Or like, uh, what can we do to help you? Or um, here's some free uh, UK pens. Uh, and other thing to be aware of when you're starting to set up your practice, and, and also for these liaisons, is never say no to your referrals when you start. Uh, be free with your phone number. Uh, be free with your email. Uh, let them know how they can reach you or, or, your, um, or your office staff um, easily. Let them know like if you have any question or problem, they should contact you so you can help, help them get through it. Um, let them know what you're doing that's new within the, the, uh, the practice that you're getting into. Let them know what you're interested in so they know someone, oh, well, that person's really interested in um, salivary neoplasms. Well, I should send it to that guy because he's really interested in it. He loves it. Um, and another just kind of randomly um, I put on here, avoid doing anything crazy when you first start a practice for that first year. I mean, um, if you can avoid it. I mean, there are certain instances where like it, it's just going to happen. Like you're going to be in the middle of the night or there's going to be some like emergency where you need to do it or else that patient doesn't get taken care of. If you have the option, if you have um, um, partners that you work with. Um, don't try to do something crazy that might get you a bad rap. Uh, put your name on that m, m list for that first year or that first few weeks that you're in practice. You want to make a solid name for yourself when you first start out, that you are uh, very dependable, that you are reliable, that you uh, are, are going to be well thought um, or uh, think out through your surgeries very well and not going to put your patients in harm, harm's way and, and you'll get more referrals because of that. And then you can start branching out once you feel comfortable, once you've developed that referral base. Coders. Coders, you guys don't really interact with much either except for when they're saying to sign your notes and stuff. Um, these are the, the way that you make your money. Um, there's no way to emphasize that you can be the best doctor, you can have the best patient um, physician relationship in the world, you can be like one of the best docs on like the Euros News World, World Report. But if you don't know how to code and code well, um, you won't be paid like you should. Um, I think this is one of the big things that people can overlook because this isn't really taught very, very much uh, for, um, 
uh, for you in, on the training level. I try to teach you some of the laryngology things I've learned, but there are still things I'm learning. Uh, and there are things that change every year too. Uh, learn codes when you're training so that when, when you hit the ground running, you can really hit the ground running in terms of you're not learning about how to um, code that surgery that you know you're going to do a whole lot. Of. Like if you know you're going to go into general practice and be doing a lot of, of ear surgeries, know the codes. Uh, know when you can code. Know when you get reimbursed for that code. Um, again, sometimes these models are based off collections. They're not based off of RVUs. Uh, so whatever you are getting, actually getting collected back um, is crucial. So some codes will uh, necessitate. So case in point, my fellowship director was big on saying like for stroke, you have to have a diagnosis of dysphonia. It doesn't matter if you have dysphagia or cough or, or mention in the note. If you don't have a diagnosis code of dysphonia, you typically will not get um, reimbursed for that stroke code um, for in the office. That's one example. Um, if you, for Bronx, if you don't list that you saw the carina and the um, main stem bronchi, you're not going to get reimbursed for that bronchoscopy. Uh, a lot of different nuances of that, that if you don't know how to write your op reports, your clinic notes, uh, or just the specific code, you're not going to get reimbursed for that. Office manager. Um, this can be huge. Um, they can make you successful or tank you uh, if they're not good or worth their salt. Um, they run your day-to-day -day business. Uh, you don't want to be uh, hiring, firing, doing all this other stuff. Uh, you want to be working with the medical part of things. You want to be doing um, what builds your referral base. You want to be doing all other stuff. Uh, they do all the day-to-day -day running of um, getting your supplies, getting everything else for you. Um, I had a... Um, especially for certain practices where it's more uh, private or it's a uh, uh, cash only or like a, like a facial plastic type model, they can really, really help you um, in terms of uh, developing those referral bases, uh, being the person that calls on the phone um, for uh, developing these relationships, being the person that can figure out like, what's going to be the going rate for this type of surgery, uh, how we're going to do this telemedicine switch to practice. Um, they're going to be really, really useful for you and be very important for you. So if you're going to a job search, make sure you meet with the office manager so you kind of know what they are, kind of know what their strengths are, uh, and kind of know you can kind of work with them. Um, tenure uh, and or partner. Uh, I can speak more on the tenure part, obviously. Uh, multiple different ways for this. Um, there's academic versus private, uh, clinical assistant professor versus assistant professor. Um, about half of us new people within this department are uh, clinical assistant professor versus a special title series assistant professor, um, um, where it's not clinical. Clinical assumes that you're going to not really be writing grants or writing as many papers. It's not going to be the main crux of why you're here at an academic institution. Uh, there's also adjunct faculty positions for if you're like in a private practice, but you want to have some type of teaching role or something in the institution that's close by. A lot of places will have some type of adjunct role that they can kind of give you that you can, again, put on your CV and, and have that be something you can work with. Um, promotion versus tenure, they are different um, for some of these. So for clinical assistant professor here, just case in point, um, you can get promoted to clinical associate professor, but you cannot really get tenure. Tenure means that you technically can't get fired, although I don't really know what that means anymore uh, because things, change, things always are changing. Uh, assistant professor, that can you can get promoted as well as get tenure. Um, it's I feel like the clinical um, assistant professor is becoming more and more of a thing at academic institutions uh, across the whole nation. Uh, it's something I was seeing more and more um, at all the different sites I was looking at jobs at when I was applying. Um, uh, becoming a partner, this is another thing from your contract. You should figure out how you can become a partner. Know the steps that you can take that will, will ultimately end up in you becoming a partner um, and, and getting a piece of the pie, so to speak, for that private practice job. Or if you're going to an academic position, how 
what are the steps, how long before you come up for stuff, what are the requirements for that role that you will get promoted. Uh, that should always be in writing, um, well thought out, well uh, described to you before you start there, uh, or else you might get into a job where you can't become partner, where you can't become uh, tenure and promoted, and then you're kind of stuck. And that's basically it for my talk. I don't know if there's any other questions you guys have for any of those different topics. Anybody? None for me, that was really helpful. Thank you.